Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. We are so happy that you joined us today. My name is Lorna Costantini, and I'm pleased to co-host the Classroom 2.0 Live sessions with Peggy George and Kim Case. Today, we're going to be talking about interactive math activities for K-8 and the math playground with our special guest, Colleen King. Each week at this time, we gather to discuss technology tools and issues. Our broadcast consists of a one-hour show that is recorded. The link to the full video, audio recording, and chat log will be posted to our Classroom 2.0 Live website at live.classroom20.com. If you are new to our show today, we want to let you know that we really are happy that you're here, but we support newbies every time you come, but this is not a tutorial and it's not a how-to session. It's a discussion around the topic of the week with our presenters as the lead in the show. The topic for each week is posted on our website, so you can be prepared with links, ideas, and tools you'd like to share during the show. So please take a minute in advance and come and bring your ideas. The show is just about as much about the presenter as it is about you in the chat room. We want to express express a special thanks to Tammy Moore, who you know joins us every week to provide closed captioning for our show. So if there's anyone who does have uh, hearing issues, then please let them know that Tammy's here to help. We will have an open mic time at the end of the show, and I know Colleen is willing to stay with us this evening, um, excuse me, this afternoon. Kim will fi finish out the show for us, and then we, if you haven't had your questions answered, please stay and uh, talk to Keen Colleen after the show. If you're going to speak, we want you to make sure that you run the audio set up wizard before you use your mic. So that's tools, audio, and audio setup wizard. If you're going to come to the mic and you haven't done that, you may have an issue with talking to us. And if you don't have a headset, then we will get audio feedback. And if that's the case, we would ask you to continue to ask your questions in the chat room. And uh, Kim or Colleen will respond for you. Those of you who are new to the session, I hope you took a chance to take our started, getting started video because we're not going to go through the details on how to use Illuminate today other than to remind you that when you do want to ask a question, on the bottom of the participant window is the raise your hand button and emoticons and applause symbols. And over there beside the little blue door is the green check and the red X to help us vote in the poll questions. So let's get started and go to the world map. And let's use the laser pointer. And that is the tool in the left of the whiteboard that has a little starburst on the end. Take your pointer and pop in where you are located on the world map. Someone's in Hawaii, United States. I'm in Canada. I'm just going to give you a minute to Show us where you are. I know Virginia is over there in Italy. Thanks for get, joining us again, Virginia. It's nice to see you here. Thank you very much. Let's move on to our first poll question. Remember that you can vote with the green X. That's pretty good. The red X or the green check. So our first poll question today is, have you used the math playground site with students? So if you have green check, if you haven't, red X. This will give an a calling idea of the needs of our participants today. Looks like there's a lot of red X's, but I'm going to, I think everybody's had a chance to vote. I am going to publish the results. There, look at that, 67% of us today have not had a chance to take a look at Math Playground and use it with students. So our next poll question, I'm just going to clear the results there. Have you used the Math Apprentice site with students? So go ahead, green check or red X, register your vote for us, please. I think almost everybody's had a chance to vote. Let's take a look at the results. Big number again, 77% have not had a chance to take a look at the Math Apprentice site. So I know, Colleen, you have lots to share today. 
going to clear the votes again and go to our last poll question. Do you use interactive online math resources with your students? A green check or a red X? I think everybody's just about had a chance to vote here. I'll show the results. I think it's pretty obvious. There are some great teachers in this room using math interactive resources with their students. 75% are doing that. Thanks, everyone, for working through the poll questions with us. I just want to give you one heads up here to choose the wide layout for your uh, Illuminate room. It will help you see the web tours that uh, Colleen is going to be sharing with us. And you'll find that under View, Layouts, and Wide Layout. And I think you'll have a better experience if you make your layout with that setting. So with all that, I'd like to take an opportunity now to welcome our very special guest, Colleen King. And I am now going to turn the mic over to Colleen so that she can share with us some of her experiences and her background and tell us all about today. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on as a guest. Uh, this is a terrific show, and, and it's really quite an honor. Um, I'm a math teacher at a private learning center just outside of Boston where I also head up curriculum development. Uh, one of our goals is to design new ways to teach math concepts. Uh, two areas we're focusing on are using games to teach math and teaching math concepts through computer programming. Uh, when I'm not teaching, I design activities for Math Playground. Um, the idea for the site really came from my students' love of online games and, and video games. Uh, my colleagues and I thought, that one way to keep students engaged was to literally make a game out of math. Uh, we asked students to come up with game ideas, and we worked with them to link their stories to the math we wanted them to learn. And what resulted were these very creative role-playing games in which math concepts were integrated into gameplay. So I wondered if, if there was some way to capture the excitement this was generating and share it online. And uh, that, was, that was eight years ago. And I had no programming skills and knew nothing at all about web publishing. So I've been learning as I go and publishing my ideas on Math Playground with the goal of eventually translating some of these classroom games into versions that can be played online. Uh, in the meantime, Math Playground has developed into a much more versatile site, um, much more than I had ever envisioned. And now there's something there for everyone and for every learning style. That's a little bit about me and, and my work. OK, so I, I have some poll questions for you as well. Um, the first one is, which of the following tools do you use most frequently with online math resources in your classroom? And you can select uh, A, B, C, D, or E from uh, the panel on the left. Is there a way to display the results? Ah, great. Um, so A was the uh, interactive whiteboard. And wow, 16, 28% are currently not using online resources. Um, interesting. I, I'd actually like to talk with you about um, why that is and, and what you are currently doing in, in the math classroom. Um, that's very interesting. OK, let's, um, let's take a look at the second poll question. If you have used interactive math resources, what percentage of your lesson plans include these tools? Like, do you use them every, every time you teach math, or how often do you use them? Wow, 
So it looks like the majority of, of the audience are using resources pretty extensively. Great. Oh, that's a good point. Not everyone is teaching math here. Um, someone just pointed that out in the, the audience in the chat room. Um, all right, poll question three. Uh, which, what is more important to you as a teacher, games that develop computational skills or games that develop problem solving skills? And of course, this would be from the perspective of a math teacher. Oh, terrific. OK, it seems to be overwhelmingly in favor of problem solving. Great. Ah, someone's asking if there's a third choice um, to answer uh, that both are important. Um, but I was asking for a preference there. But of course, computation is certainly important in mathematics. Maureen asked a great question that maybe we could talk about um, during the discussion period. Um, doesn't matter what age group. Um, is problem solving more important uh, with younger students or older students? And um, what about computation? Is that more important with um, young, younger grade levels or, or um, middle school and high school levels? OK, well, thank you. I, I think um, that's all the poll questions I have. Um, we can go on to the newbie question. OK, the newbie question. Um, asks, what are interactive online math resources? Um, interactive online math resources are, are like many software programs that run in a browser and are therefore accessible to anyone with internet access. Two of the most popular types of activities are learning games and virtual math manipulatives. Learning games are tremendously appealing to both students and teachers. Uh, depending on the game, students can play independently, uh, compete with the computer or with students online, or work with classmates to solve problems that are projected onto an interactive whiteboard. Uh, games are most often used to practice facts, uh, build mental math skills, and reinforce concepts students are learning in school. Uh, however, games can also serve as an introduction to a new concept or provide motivation to learn more about a topic, and can even be used as an assessment tool. The versatility of online learning games has made them extremely popular teaching tools. Virtual manipulatives are a whole other class of, of interactive resources. They are often identical to their real world counterparts, for example, base 10 blocks, Cuisinaire rods, geode boards, fraction bars, and tangrams. From my own experiences in the classroom, virtual manipulatives have distinct advantages over physical objects. I found that students who were reluctant to use blocks and other objects were often eager to experiment with the online versions. My students were often distracted by uh, physical objects and viewed them as toys rather than tools. Um, I found that students were able to focus more on the math concepts when they used online manipulatives. Um, the greatest advantages of, of online math resources in general is that they are often free to use. Uh, they're always available, so that means students can work on concepts at home with parents, and they support differentiation in the classroom. And we're going to take a look at some of the online interactive math resources um, that I have stockpiled over at Math Playground. So. Um, we can begin a, a web tour. And I'm not sure how to begin a web tour. <laughs> OK. 
Colleen, just go yes. ahead and click on the globe up at the top. Oh, okay, great. And then you'll paste your URL in there, Excellent. and then we'll drop it into the chat. Okay. Okay, one more second. Okay, so I will be your tour guide for this overview of, of Math Playground. Is everyone seeing the um, home page of the site? Okay. Um, the home page is the gateway to most of the activities on the site. The site consists of six main sections. Um, on the left, on the navigation bar, you see math games, word problems, logic puzzles, and math videos. <coughs> then more toward the center, um, actually the bottom of the page, there are um, links to computational activities. So we have uh, computation flashcards and math worksheets. People still like these things. Um, and we have manipulatives as well. So the most visited section of the site is math games, so I thought we could start there. And, and what I'm going to do is just give you an overview of the different sections of the site. Um, later on, we'll get a chance to actually explore certain activities more in depth. So I'm going to take us to math games. And there's quite an extensive collection of, of games on this page. Um, the games cover topics ranging from multiplication, fractions, money, and percents to algebraic reasoning, graphing, geometry, order of operations, and, and more. Um, I checked Google Analytics uh, just recently to see what the most popular games currently are, and, and I was very happily surprised to find that um, students are spending most of their time here at Math Apprentice. Um, this is where students can try out different careers that use math. And we'll get to explore that activity uh, after the overview. But um, this confirms what I've been seeing at my math center with role playing games. These types of games are very appealing to students and can be an effective way to, to teach math. And Colleen, is there a fee for using any of these um, activities? Oh, no. No, not at all. Everything right. is free. OK, so um, now I'm going to take you to word problems. <laughs> Tim asked if I have a donate button. Uh, no, no, I don't. Um, I do have sponsorship for the site, so um, part of it goes to cover you know, some fees I incur in, in putting up the activities, and I'm also uh, donating a percentage of it to donors choose um, to uh, math projects that I think uh, need to be funded. Um, okay, uh, in the word problem section, uh, we have a range of word problems for students as young as early as grades you know, two and three. We have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all the way up to um, actually SAT math concepts that you know would be okay for grades seven and up. Um, most of these word problems uh, come with step-by-step -step video instruction, so these activities are great to use with an interactive whiteboard. Um, you can you can project the problem. On the uh, on the whiteboard, and ask your students uh, you know, how they might go about solving the problem, and then afterwards you can view the actual step-by-step -step, um, solution, which is only one way to solve the problem. So you can compare uh, your students' methods to to the method I present. Um, but the most popular resource on this page is Thinking Blocks. Um, Thinking Blocks is a tool that teaches students how to model math word problems. Um, often students will just search for the numbers within a word problem and scan the problem for keywords that hint at what operation to use. But that doesn't always work, so it's important to have another strategy, almost like a, a fail-safe strategy, in place. So um, we'll, we'll definitely be visiting thinking blocks later so I can show you how, how that works. OK, now let's take a look at um, the logic puzzles section. 
Uh, these puzzles are wonderful for developing critical thinking and spatial reasoning skills. Most of these puzzles have a number of different levels, and that makes them accessible to everyone while still providing a challenge for those who want to go further. Um, you'll probably recognize many of these games. Um, a lot of them are, are pretty well known on the internet. <coughs> the coin weighing puzzle is particularly difficult, but works well on an interactive whiteboard as a group activity. <coughs> OK, our next section I'm going to take you to is math videos. The original idea here was to invite students to send in their math questions, and I would create a math cast with a step-by-step -step solution. And this went really well for a while, but when the site grew in popularity, I began to get hundreds and hundreds of video requests every day. So it was just impossible to keep up with the demand, and unfortunately, I had to end that program. But you know, there are quite a few videos to choose from. And I recently partnered with Brightstorm, which is a company that creates math videos for upper level students. And they have uh, graciously allowed Math Playground to, to show many of their algebra and geometry videos. So I think there's, there's probably about 70 plus videos on the page right now. Yeah, Peggy is saying the videos are so helpful. What, what's great is, is just that ability to, to be able to stop at, at a part that you want to review again or you don't understand and um, you know, go through it at your own pace. And finally, the, the next major section of the site that I want to show you is uh, manipulatives. Uh, here we have um, balance scales for algebra, simple algebraic equations. Um, balance scales for fractions, decimals, and percentages. Um, we have function machines and Cuisinaire rods, geo boards, and uh, even a, a spirograph. Oops, looks like one of my pictures isn't coming through, but uh, there are tangrams on the page as well. Um, so quite a bit to choose from, and, and again. All of these activities work wonderfully with, with an interactive whiteboard or just simply projected on some kind of screen. I, I actually don't have an interactive whiteboard. Uh, we, we just can't afford that at the Math Center. So I just project activities onto um, a regular whiteboard. And it, it, works, it works very well. OK, so that's my overview. Um, now I'd like to take you to some specific activities. Oh, um, Judy is asking for the link for the manipulatives. You actually have to go to the, to the home page, which I'm showing on screen. And at the bottom of the home page, on the right side, it says manipulatives. There's a, a picture of a teacher with some uh, geometric shapes. And just click on that, and that'll take you right to the manipulatives. OK, so let's take a look at, at some specific activities. So I have to switch over to application sharing. So you'll no longer be on a tour. What's going to happen now is, is that I'm going to, to share my browser with you so that you can see exactly what I'm clicking on. So not just where I'm going, but what I'm actually doing on the screen. Um, and you, I think you're going to be given a link so that you can go there as well. Um, so you can either do it from your own browser, or you can watch what I'm doing. The only difference is that we're going to be seeing um, different questions on the pages, because uh, they're always randomly generated. So uh, you're welcome to follow along with me, or, or do your own uh, thing with uh, your own web browser. All right, so I will get that started. Talk amongst yourselves. OK, are you seeing the Math Playground page again? Are you seeing my, my mouse? Great. 
Okay, I thought we'd start with Math Apprentice. Because, as I said earlier, students seem to be spending a lot of time here, and there's a lot to explore. So in this activity, students have the opportunity to try out eight different careers that use math. And the activities range in difficulty. Some of the topics, such as area, perimeter, bar graphs, and ratios, are well known to students. But there are some topics, such as trigonometry, that are clearly outside the realm of even middle school math. However, these topics are presented in a way that allows kids to use the math concepts without having to know all the background information. I created Math Apprentice because I wanted students to know that there's more to math than memorizing facts and doing repetitive drills. I really wanted them to know that people are using math every day to accomplish really neat things, things that might interest them and therefore might possibly spark an interest in math. So um, let's start with uh, Builders, Inc. Because this has more familiar math concepts. All right, when you, I don't think um, you're getting any audio from me, which is, which is fine. Um, you'll have audio if you're doing it in your own browser. But I think it's just as well that, that there isn't any audio um, uh, from the app sharing. Um, when you start an activity in Math Apprentice, you're first greeted by an employee of that company. And the employee will explain some of the, the ways math relates to, to his or her job. Then you want to start the activity. And again, you're greeted by that employee. And now they're telling you something specific about the activity you're about to do. So I'm going to click Free Play. And this is the, an opportunity for students just to try out um, looking at different shapes and, and seeing how the perimeter and area change. So we start with a square, uh, actually. Yeah, square. <laughs> and um, we're given the perimeter and the area. And now students can click and drag the handles and just change the size of that rectangle. And, and the perimeter and area change as they do that. Um, they can look at how the area and perimeter changes um, when, we, when we vary the structure of a triangle. And we have a trapezoid, which um, actually can be made into a um, quadrilateral or a parallelogram. And we have a, a circle. And they can change the radius of that circle and see how that changes the perimeter and area. So after students have spent some time playing with these different shapes and getting a sense of of how the perimeter and area changes as they um, increase or decrease the size of these shapes, they can try to solve a problem. So we're told that a client needs the following room shapes and sizes. They need a rectangular room that has an area of 24 square units and a perimeter of 22 units. They have a triangular room that has an area of 120 square units. and a a room in the shape of a trapezoid with an area of 12 square units. And what the students have to do is figure out how to change these different shapes to give them, to get the area and perimeters that the client wants. Anyone want to give it a try? How about the uh, rectangle? Um, what should the dimensions be so that the area is 24 and the perimeter is 22? We could try 4 by 6. Will that do it? Uh, Kim wants to try 3 by 8. Um, so we have two sides that are 8. That's 16. Two sides that are 3. That's 6. Um, 6 and 16 are, yes, 22. So that works for the, the rectangle. Now we can do the triangle. How can we? Um, change the shape of our triangle so that it has an area of 120 square units. It's a little bit trickier because the area of the triangle is actually half of the base times the width, or our base times height. And 
And then, of course, even more difficult than the triangle would be the, uh, the trapezoid, because here they have to figure out the uh, length of the two bases, as well as the height, and try to come up with, with 12 square units. So this is one of, of uh, the eight activities in, in Math Apprentice. Uh, let's go back. I'm going to bring you back to um, the starting page. And um, does anybody have um, a preference for where we go next? Rides, adventure rides? <laughs> OK. Um, here we're introduced to an engineer who explains how math is used in roller coaster design. And what we have here, what, what we're seeing is um, think of it as the, the first hill of a, of a roller coaster. And we're, we're treating it as, as a line, as, as the slope of a line. So we're looking at the angle of elevation and the starting height. Um, so over on the right-hand side, we can vary the angle of elevation. We can make it very steep or not. And we can change the starting height of the roller coaster. So as high as 440 feet and as low as 40 feet. And we can see how that will affect the speed of, of the roller coaster car. So if we have a pretty steep incline and a high starting height, um, this will calculate the speed for us. And we can attain 98 miles per hour when the angle of elevation is 65 degrees and the starting height is 440. If we um, have a less steep incline and we start at a lower height, it should go much slower. And it is. And it'll compute the speed for us. And we get um, 51 miles per hour. So this is giving students uh, a sense of how angle of elevation and the starting height affect the speed of a roller coaster. So now they're going to actually try to solve a problem. Oops, reset and solve. So a customer is asking for a roller coaster design. They want a, an incline of 75 degrees, and they want to achieve a speed of 60 miles per hour. So the question is, how high should the roller coaster hill be in order to get the speed the customer needs? Um, so we're going to set the angle of elevation at 75 degrees, and then we're going to graph it. And what we're seeing is a graph of um, the speed versus the starting height of the hill. So the customer wants the speed to be 60 miles per hour. So we're going to move the slider to 60 degrees. And then we can, I mean, yeah, 60 miles per hour, sorry, not 60 degrees. 60 miles per hour, and then we're going to look down and read the height. And that looks to be 140. So we'll set that with the slider. and check it out, and, and we were correct. Um, there's an additional roller coaster activity where students can see how um, the hills of a roller coaster can be modeled with a type of equation called a, a polynomial. And what they can do is change the values of the um, coefficients in the polynomial and see how that changes the shape of the roller coaster hills. And then they can send the roller coaster car for a ride. Again, this math is, is way above them. But I think it's great for kids to play around with, with more advanced math ideas. It gives them a sense of, of what's coming up, what's, where this is all leading to. And, and it gets them excited. And, and they get to see how math relates to things that, that matter to them. Um, I'm going to. I guess um, time is really moving quickly here. So I just wanted to show you two other things uh, very, very quickly. Um, Doodles is, uh, we, in Doodles, we meet an artist who's using math equations to create incredible, fascinating designs. Um, and there's four different curves that students can take a look at, or actually four different sets of equations. And I thought it was interesting um, to take a look at at how changing the different variables make incredibly different um, 
designs. Now, I know the, the equation is, is very complex. I mean, I, I even think it's rather complicated. Um, but all we really want students to know is, is that math is even related to art and, um, and how just varying small little things in an equation can make an incredible difference in, in the design. So let's see what it looks like. Um, Okay, when we, when we run the program with these particular values, uh, A is 172, B is 53, C is 117, we get this design. Now we're just going to, just going to change the value of B to 222. And let's see what happens. We get a completely different design, which I should have, hold on, I should have really done that. Uh, not on top of the, the first one, because you really can't see it. Um, I'm going to try again. So we get a, a completely different design. Now, I'm going to continue to just change the value of B and watch how the designs change. I'm going to go down to 201, and we get a completely different design just by changing the value. Now I'm just going to change the value to 199, just a, a small change in the value. And look at this, a completely different look. This is amazing. And I think kids will get really excited by this. But someone needs to be able to show them how to make these subtle changes. I'm going to go down to 94 now. And again, a, a whole other look. Now, watch what happens when we go to 180. I think this is it. We just simply get a straight line. You know, why is that? What's going on? How come when it's just one, one number higher or one number lower, we're, we're getting these fascinating designs, but when it's a 180, we, all we get is a, a line? That kind of stuff is, is very, very interesting uh, to me anyway. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to take us out of here. And I also wanted to bring you to uh, Trigon Studios. and. Trigon Studios is, is actually um, a place where math is used to create the animation that you see in movies. And a lot of that animation is done with a branch of math called trigonometry. So I give an explanation to students about how trig functions behave. Um, they get to see what a sine function looks like. And the sine function is, is connected to the um, scale of this little design. And you can see how it's just going back and forth. It's oscillating. And that's the idea I want to get across to them about trig functions. So now we go to the movie set. And this is kind of bizarre. We have a character uh, that's operating a remote control plane. And, and we have some large bugs moving around and this very strange looking character in the foreground. Um, I'm going to uh, stop everybody. And what we're going to do is take a look at um, how we how we can control these different types of animation. And all this animation is being controlled by, by math equations, which is amazing. Um, so right now, oops, I'm looking at the wrong one. I wanted to look at uh, airplane. So looking at the airplane controls. And I want to look at how we can control the X motion. Let's, let's get it going um, on. So you can see right now it's just kind of almost doing a, well, it's an oscillating pattern, kind of like a maybe a backwards S or something. Um, I'm going to change the value of A. In fact, I'm going to bring it all the way down to 0. And what happens? By changing the value of A to 0, we have no motion in the horizontal direction. All the motion is, is straight up and down. As we start to increase A, we get a little horizontal motion along with our vertical movement. And then if we go all the way up, it's moving so far horizontally that it's, it's off the screen. And you could do the same thing for the, for the Y motion. Um, if we Actually, I'm going to reset this to what I had before. And then I'm going to change the value of C. And now all we have is horizontal motion. There's no motion at all in the vertical direction. So just by kind of playing with these different controls, students don't actually have to understand the math behind it. What they need to understand is that they can make changes to the values in the equation 
and those changes cause uh, a difference in motion. Um, and I think kids enjoy playing with the character because uh, you can make him uh, walk really strange ways. Um, we can control the upper leg motion. And so he's, he's walking in all different manners. Um, there are some cool ones where it looks like he's running, somewhere he's skating, dancing. It's kind of neat. So kids can, like he's walking backwards, sort of a moonwalk, but he's moving forward. Um, <laughs> so kids can play with all these different values and, and get a sense for how that, that changes the motion. All right, let's, um, let's leave Math Apprentice altogether and go to um, some math games. Um, I'm really a fan of algebraic reasoning puzzles. Um, we had been using a workbook series called Groundworks, which introduces uh, the very the big ideas of algebra through math puzzles. So I decided to make some interactive versions of these puzzles for Math Playground. Um, one is is called Away the Wang Doodles. Uh, this is this one's tough. Actually, you know what? I shouldn't have started with this. Um, excuse me. I'm just going to bring us back to math games, and I want to go to this one. Um, okay, here we have um, balance skills, and we have three levels of difficulty. In the first level, students are just shown two scales. One scale has only one type of object. The other scale has uh, some number of two different objects. But one of those objects also appeared on, on the bottom scale. So students have to figure out the value of, of one drum. So what they would do is um, first look at the scale where all they have is the umbrellas. And they know if three umbrellas have a value of 15, one umbrella would have to be 5. Then they can take that information and apply it to the second scale. These two umbrellas would um, have a value of 10. We subtract that from 24. And that means the two drums have a total value of 14. So one drum is 7. And we check our work, and, and that's correct. Um, and it can get quite difficult. In level two, now we're asked not just for the value of one object, but for the value of many objects. But it's the same process. So students can apply what they learned in, in the first scale to this, to this section. Um, again, the cars have a total value of 30, so one of them would be six. Um, we have two cars on the bottom scale, so that's 12. Subtract that from 78. We have 66, so the six ladybugs together are 66. But we only want to know the value of three ladybugs, so we'll take half of that. It's 33, and uh, we, we answered that correctly. And then it gets incredibly difficult when you have three scales, and none of the scales have only one object. So what do you do in this case? Well, one, one way to approach this is to find a scale whose objects also exist on another scale. So look at the uh, scale that reads 70. You have four popsicles and, and two apples. We see on the scale next to it that there are also four popsicles and two apples there. But you know we have three more popsicles as well, but that's OK. All we care about is that these four popsicles and two apples have a value of 70. Take that away from 106, and we have 36. So these three popsicles have a value of 36. Now we know that one popsicle is 12. Now we have to take that information and apply it to this third scale. We know that five popsicles and four pumpkins have a value of 80. The value of one popsicle we found out before is 12. Five times 12 is 60. Subtract that from 80. The pumpkins have a value of 20. One pumpkin has a value of 5. And if I didn't wreck up, yeah, we got that one right. Kids love these kinds of problems. I, they can't get enough of them. Um, at the math center, we actually have students creating their own problems. So we'll set up three, three of these scales. And we have all sorts of you know, physical manipulatives, objects, and they'll set up their, their own scales. They have to figure out the values, and then they'll challenge their partner 
to, to figure out um, the value of a specific object. Um, I can't say enough about, about um, activities like, like this one. They're absolutely fantastic. So for students then who are looking for um, a greater challenge, they can try Wei the Wang Doodles. And this is uh, significantly harder because now you have, you have three scales and you have two different objects on each of the three scales. Um, and you're told what um, each group of two, the value of each group of two. Yeah, um, Kim is saying there, actually, there are three variables. There are three equations and three unknowns here. Um, I don't, you might have been talking about the other scales. Um, so how would you go about solving a problem like this? And obviously, I don't want fourth or fifth graders to, to write three algebra equations and, and try to solve them. Um, so what might the process be here? Well, what I uh, tell my students to do is, is to look at two scales. And um, for example, the two on the right, we have a red wang doodle, a red wang doodle on each scale, but this scale is 18 more than the scale to the right. So what's causing that? Well, that's being caused by the green wang doodle, which weighs more than the blue wang doodle. In fact, we can say that a green wang doodle is the same as a blue wang doodle plus 18. So now we have a relationship between the green wang doodle and the blue wang doodle, and we can use that by um, substituting that over here at this scale. We know that a green wang doodle is just a blue wang doodle plus 18. So we put a blue wang doodle here and the number 18, and we know that two, wa two blue wang doodles and the number 18 should give us 26. Um, I actually have a blog post that I wrote about how to use this particular activity as well as the other algebraic reasoning um, activity, and I will drop that link. Whoops. Drop the link into, um, oh, here it is, actually. You can see it on the screen. I'll, I'll drop a link in for you. Um, but anyway, it explains the process that I use to, to solve this problem with my students and, and a conversation we actually had in the classroom. OK, I am like running out of time really quickly. Um, so I'm going to go to back to math playground and math games, and I'm going to give you a quick tour of the X detectives. Um, in the X detectives, a student, it's a role playing game. Students take on the role of detectives in training, and they're trying to track down this wayward agent X. And this agent X is using uh, pre-algebra and algebra skills to kind of foil all the other detectives. So um, in order to catch this guy, you have to be pretty good at solving algebra problems. So I'm going to skip the intro and just apply to be an X detective. Oh, oh, I should have skipped the intro. No, never mind. Well, we'll just go through this. And OK, eventually we get to the X detective's compound. And the students can um, drive this X mobile around. And they can visit a transformation room where they, whoops. <laughs> where they uh, learn about reflections, rotations, uh, reflections, translations, and rotations in the transformation room. They have to solve problems there. Um, then they can head into the gadget shop where they see some of these algebraic reasoning problems that I showed you earlier. And again, there's, there's three different levels. Um, they can head on over to the integer room, and they learn um, how to add and subtract integers by uh, creating zero pairs or using a number line model. And then there are practice problems for them. And then they can head on over to um, functions and graphing, where they learn how to um, plot points and to uh, create a line from a table of, of values. And students can play in practice mode where they just take their time and, and try out the different areas. Or they can play in game mode um, where the object is to um, collect four gold coins in a, in a certain amount of time. Um, OK, I'm going to take us now to um, 
a new game I created uh, called uh, Guide the Gecko. Uh, this is for uh, somewhat younger students. It's a journey through the land of fractions. The idea here is that um, this character is trying to get home, but there's gaps in the road. And students have to figure out how to fill the gaps in the road so that the character can cross and continue on his way. So we'll start the game. And there's actually there's 20 levels in this game. And um, it starts out really simple. And then it builds in complexity. So for example, the, the first challenge here is to fill the gap with six fractions of equal value. Um, so we're told that the gap is one meter. So we need six pieces that each measure one-sixth. And we check our gap, and if it's correct, the character continues over. OK, now it gets a little bit trickier, because our gap is two meters, not one meter. But one meter has already been placed. So in that sense, it's the same problem as before. Except now we have to use four fractions of equal value, so we're going to use fourths. And that ought to do it. Just going to take you through a couple of levels. I'm, I'm not going to go all the way through the game. But I just wanted you to get a sense of, of how it progresses. Um, OK, now the gap is again 2 meters. And now we have to fill the gap with 10 fractions. So actually, this is quite a, quite a bit harder, but it builds upon the last two uh, levels that the students did. So we need 10 fractions. Um, that will fill two gaps, uh, two meters. Well, that means that five fractions would fill one meter. So there's some proportional reasoning. So if five fractions have to fill one meter, I guess we're going to use fifths. So now the student knows to place um, fifths in the gap. And that should do it. And it gets the uh, character across. And like I said, this continues on, uh, moves into equivalent fractions. Then it moves on to adding and subtracting fractions. It goes into mixed numbers. Then they move on to uh, multiplication and, and division. Um, OK, now I'm going to go to, I guess I'm going to go to thinking blocks, because we're really short on time. Um, so. Oh, Beth, Beth just asked what happens when the student makes an error in Guide the Gecko. Um, actually, they have three opportunities to try. So if they make an error, they're told to try again. They make another error again, another error, try again, another error. Um, on the third error, the blocks kind of just fall down, and um, the student would have to start from the beginning. OK, thinking blocks. Um, is used quite extensively in classrooms uh, all around the world, actually. Um, thinking blocks came from work we were doing at the center with Singapore math. Uh, Singapore math has a very visual and logical approach to solving word problems. Students actually model the relationships in the problem by drawing bars of various lengths. When I was teaching this 10 years ago, I made these bars with colored magnetic strips that could be positioned on the whiteboard. And students would come up to the board and model their problems. And eventually, we had fourth graders solving really complex math problems. So um, this approach to problem solving was so powerful, I wanted to find a way to share it. So a few years later, I started working on th the Thinking Blocks program, which is an interactive version of the Singapore math bar models. Um, there are three thinking blocks programs. I have uh, addition and subtraction, and multiplication and division, and ratio word problems. Um, each program contains six distinct types of, of problems, as well as an independent practice section. And there's a uh, video introduction that shows students how each, each unique type of problem can be solved. So they get a sense of, of how to use the program. And then in the independent practice section, um, I'm not presenting a tutorial to them. I'm letting them solve the problem on their own. But if they need help, there's a video with a similar problem that will show them how to get started. So let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at ratio word problems. We'll go to uh, part total ratios. 
So you're given a little introduction. If you play the intro, there'll be a, a video that students can watch. But we'll just go right to practice. So the thinking blocks screen is divided up into uh, four sections. The problem is presented here. The model building area is just below that. Um, some feedback is given here up at the, uh, the top right hand side. And just below that are, are the actual problem solving steps that the students go through. Um, yes, Pat, the site is all free, but you have to tell your friends. <laughs> um, OK, so let's, let's try a problem. Uh, Mrs. Gavin had 36 students in her class. One out of six students stayed after school yesterday for math practice. The other students stayed for play. Um, how many students stayed for play practice? Um, so one out of six students stayed after school. We have to find the ratio of students who, play, who stayed for play practice versus students who stayed for math practice. Um, so we have one out of six stayed for math, which means five of the six must have stayed for play practice. So we model the problem by actually showing the ratio, which is five to one. And this type of problem is very hard for students because they don't realize, they think six is another part. They don't realize six is the whole. So they'll think the ratio is one to six. But this shows them that the ratio is actually um, one to five. So let's check our work. And it's correct, so we're given a little more of the model. Um, we're asked to, to um, type in some information in this area, which would give us the total amount. Um, so we were told in the problem that there are 36 students in the class, so we'll enter 36 there. What we're trying to find out is how many students stayed for play practice, so we're going to type in a question mark there. Now we can check our work. OK, we're told this is great work. We're going to find the missing information now. Um, and we're given a little hint. We know that six blocks equals 36. And six blocks are, are coming from all the blocks in the model. So if six blocks have a value of 36, one block has a value of six, we're looking for five blocks. So that's how, that has to be 30. We check it. And it asks us, you know, often students will just type in a number in response to a word problem, but this actually gets them to think about what that number means. So how many students stayed for play practice? It was 30 students. And we check our work, and great. So actually, um, at this level, in the ratio level, you can see how it would be done algebraically. And it kind of goes through the process for you. Um, the questions get pretty complex that take us back to the index. But let's take a look at an advanced problem in the ratio section. Um, Greg and Kevin each, actually, I am, I guess I'm way out of time. Um, I'm sorry. I, I guess I'm way over. Um, I had some discussion questions that I really wanted to present. Um, so maybe, maybe we, can, we can head over to that. Sure. I'll go ahead and um, close the app sharing. And then we'll okay. go back to that. And okay. we'll take questions. And we will um, get to your discussion questions. I wanted to let everybody know that on March the 6th, we're going to be talking about the sweet search engine um, and research strategies for using uh, with students with the founder and developer, Mark Moran. So it's going to be a fantastic show that you're going to want to make sure that you're joining us for. And the survey will open as soon as you exit the session. And we hope that you will give us great feedback and suggest topics for future shows. And if you would like a professional development certificate sent to you, um, thank you so much, Peggy, for creating this and taking care of this. If you'll just put your name and email address on the survey when it opens up, then we Peggy will send that out to you. So give us a few days or so, um, and those will be sent out during the week. And then you can print those out and turn them in. And we would like to thank our very special guest, Colleen King and Steve Hargadon, who is the founder of Classroom 2.0 and Future of Education and Conversations.net. 
and we want to thank each of you for participating in the session today, and especially to Illuminate and to Learn Central for providing these forums for us to meet and share each week. So now I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to our very special guest, and we can start uh, with the dis discussion questions. So keep posting your questions um, in the chat. And if you'd like to take the microphone after we go over each discussion question, just click on the hand with the green arrow, and then you'll be given the ability to use the mic, and you can answer the question, share a comment, or ask a question um, off a different topic at a later time. So back to you, Colleen. OK, I'm always looking for new ideas and, and uh, new games and tools to create. So if you can ask a developer to create any kind of math resource, what would it be? Um, what, what would you like to have that, that maybe you haven't seen out there yet and would be a great asset for your, for your classroom? Place value blocks. Mm -hmm. Concrete represented. Actually, mm -hmm. there, are, there are concrete representations of um, fractions, decimals, percents on, on Math Playground and actually a lot of other sites. Um, there'll be links to other math resources, I believe, with, with this session. Yes, in our GLAM link. Because I think the virtual manipulatives of the um, Virginia something has definite has some for um, the the place value blocks okay I forgot what it's called um, speaking blocks oh no not I'm sorry never mind yeah um, I can look it up and we should sure. add it to the if it's not already there optics huh that's something I hadn't thought about a uh, Tammy suggested optics um, provide some really interesting. Okay. Oh, these are great ideas. I Thank you. Heard of that? Black box. What is black box? Um, Tammy, what is black box? Sure. Let me get that for you. With my fitness kids, we played a game called, that we called Black Box. And they learned some basic of optics, for instance, with a mirror, the angle that it comes in and that it's going to go out. And they get the entry point of the laser beam, and they get the exit point of the laser beam. And at first, they just get one simple object inside the black box, which is a mirror. And at the beginning levels, they have to figure out from the entry point and the exit point where the mirror must be. And then as they learn, they get more complicated optical uh, things inside the black box that they have to figure out how, where the exit point's going to be. And you give them more mirrors. And, and they play around with the placements of it to figure out where it goes out. And the kids love it. So they're, they're learning or exploring angles with that activity? Mm -hmm. Angles and then just basic things related to optics. Mirrors, mirrors uh -huh. are probably the most the easiest that would be for the younger students to work with. But right. you could gradually introduce what happens with lenses. If you can you can cover. Um, uh, will light be narrowed? Will it be widened? And and you could take it in a lot of different directions based on what happens with with the light on the entry and exit. Um, Peggy just asked if I uh, have activities aligned with standards, and um, no, I I don't. And I guess, you know, when I when I went into this, I really just viewed Math Playground as a as a place for kids to explore and just go wherever they wanted to, independent of whether they were learning it in school or were having it on a test. So I stayed away from assigning real specific grade levels or or standards. But I, I do get a lot of requests for that, so that's something I should maybe consider. That's a good point. Um, that's another time-consuming aspect. That, um, but you know, there are national standards, and then there are, of course, state standards, which would vary and be, you know, so difficult to align. Right. 
when you're doing all of this by yourself. And Sherry Tim Falberg posted the, a link to some information about black box, but it apparently works on principles of refracting and bending light. Okay, well these are great ideas. Thank you. Um, we can we and can move on. Oh, sorry. Oh, and they can I'm sure email you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, with oh, other yeah. suggestions, that'd be fantastic. Oh, please, please feel free to do that. Um, okay, uh, so the second discussion question. Um, oh, so what are some things developers should keep in mind when designing interactive resources for classroom use? Um, those of you who have used uh, these resources, there's probably been times when you just wish something was a little different, or you could do this or or that. What are some of these ideas? What what should I be thinking about when, when I design things? Um, people have mentioned browsers. Do, do these games oh. and activities work on all browsers? I believe so, yeah. OK. Are they Java-based games? No, they're Flash-based. So as long as you have um, uh, the Flash plugin, which is you know pretty ubiquitous, um, should mm -hmm. run. And I'm not certain if they would run on um, iPod touches. No, but um, what's great is that the upcoming version of Flash, which is supposed to be released later this spring, will actually allow you to um, take what you're creating in Flash and produce it in a format that um, a format similar to the apps. So I'll be able to start creating uh, games and tools and, and put them in the iTunes App Store. And I'm really oh, excited. Fantastic. Yeah, I I'm really about that. Very excited about that. Yes, that will definitely open up a lot of new doors for lots of programmers. Uh, someone just mentioned that Apple and Flash are having some troubles, and that's true. Um, but this should be mm -hmm. uh, apart from that, because you're actually creating the Flash in the format that is used on the iPad. On the Apple. And, uh, on, yeah, so. Awesome, awesome. And um, Peggy also mentioned about bandwidth issues. Do the games take and the activities take up a lot of bandwidth? Uh, no, no, very minimal. I thought so. If it's flash based, um, yeah. you could have a whole lab using it, and it wouldn't take up much more than um, a regular activity on the interactive activity. And right. will the apps still possibly be free on iTunes? Uh, well, most of them. I, you know, I'd like to see what happens when you when you place one for sale, just to kind of test it out. But um, mm -hmm. you know, I tend to I tend to um, do most of my activities for free, so I'm sure that'll continue. Great. Um, and some people have asked about printing assignments and printing the activities. Is that possible? Um, no. I mean, there really aren't activities to print. I mean, you could print a screenshot of, of like a word problem or something, but um, the activities are really interactive and, and not meant to be printed. Right. That's manipulated online. Right. Um, right. Yeah. You kind of take away the, I guess, the essence of the activity. Exactly. I could see you maybe wanting to print resources, I mean, the, the results to a problem right. or something sometimes. Yes, that, that is a feature that I have not included. Um, I don't know a whole lot about that end of programming, so uh, I would either need to collaborate with someone or, or learn that in order to make that happen. OK. And. Um, are there any other things that um, you would like to share with Colleen about things developers should keep in mind when designing these different activities? If so, go ahead and um, put your uh, suggestions in the chat. Videos with captions like dot subs. Um, Tim asked a question about, uh, is there anything else we can do besides spreading the word about Math Playground that would be 
helpful to you. Um, actually, the greatest thing you can do is spread the word about it. That's that's number one. But um, actually, giving me feedback. If if you're ever using an activity and and you come across a bug or or you know something's just not working the way you expect it to, or or you think I could have done something a little differently or presented it better, uh, don't hesitate to send me an email and, and let me know that. Um, I'm pretty good about responding to all these types of suggestions, and, and I'll uh, make edits and, and republish the activities. That'd be great. And is there like a setting that if they start playing a game, they can return to where it left off? Um, no. Probably not since they're not registering for an account and right. saving and that data. Most of the games are um, short enough that you don't have to play for an hour and then come back and pick up from where you left off. You could just kind of jump in. And handle it in short increments of time. Right, right. OK, and um, any more suggestions before we move on to the next question? All right, let's go ahead and go on to discussion question number three. OK, this is something I, I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, in online games, winning is often the result of earning the most points or, or being the fastest. Is this an effective motivation for learning and practicing math concepts? Uh, if not, how can winning be better defined? Are, are there other ways to win besides collecting points or being really fast? I would love to have a discussion about that. That's a good point, Roxanne, about um, collaboration. I'm not sure how you would structure that within a game. Well, what about just the end result being that you created something? You know, that that's you what I was thinking. Just the fact that you completed it or you successfully um, solved the equation. Would that isn't would that be enough? I don't know. That's. Um, I don't. I wonder about the million that. dollar question. Yeah. For some, for some students, that is enough. But for for a lot, that wouldn't do it. Um, I was thinking more like if if the math they were doing in a game led to them being able to create something or build something within the game, and so they win because they've successfully built whatever it is, not because they did it really fast or they got a lot of points but because they were able to get all the parts they needed and and were able to build something. You know, is that motivating? Like, for example, in Math Apprentice, um, the motivation in Doodles is, is creating beautiful artwork. You know, is that yeah. motivating? That's, that's the way I want to go. I, I kind of want to move away from the whole winning is points and, and speed and, and try to get into other types of, of winning. But if you had stuff like um, an email that, like somebody mentioned, um, then students have to register those accounts. And a lot of um, schools, they're not, they can't um, send or receive email as a student. So I'm not certain if that adds another complication to the to the picture. I'm sorry, I think I missed that. What what would the email be used Some, for? The, um, you like somebody mentioned that um, they would receive an email if they um, like with a certificate or saying that they, you know, congratulations, you completed this activity. Oh, okay. Um, actually, uh, in Thinking Blocks, there there is a um, certificate that they can print out. Okay. And I guess you know that has been popular a lot. Of, when when it wasn't working, I got a lot of email about that that they really missed that they couldn't print out the certificate. So that's important to students. I would think so. You know, certificate of completion and so forth. That would be okay. I can see that would be enough. A, a great motivator. Maybe not enough, but I think that would be 
a motivator in itself. Sure. But the teachers could offer additional, um, you know, I guess rewards, I'm not sure if that's the word, but reinforcement for completion of the activities or solving the equation. Um, Lois has the idea that, um, well, we use a game where students customize a car, choose colors, spoilers, as a reward for getting questions oh. correct. Um, but I would like to take that one step further and have that actually relate to the math they're doing. Um, I mean, I don't know the game you're talking about, but I'm imagining they're just answering arbitrary questions and, and then getting to choose a color or customize something. But I'm thinking more of um, having the end result actually truly be the result of, of all the math the students accomplished in the game. But these are great ideas. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate this. But I'm thinking if the game is going to keep track of levels or points or so forth, kids would then have to register in order to keep for the games to keep up with those statistics. And that kind of defeats not the purpose, but it, it puts in another area of having to register kids or so forth and make accounts. Right. And, and then it's not just on the fly or for demonstration or, or so forth. I think that puts in a different perspective. I really like the fact that it's not a login kind of site yeah. or, or a membership site. Or I, I would not want to have that layer in Yes, assessment kills the joy kind of, kind of thing. <laughs> right. um, <clears throat> if they have to log in and remember their password and so forth, I think that just complicates and I think that takes away some of the excitement of using the, the games and the resources. And of course you can use these activities with your whole class as your demonstrations and leading in your discussion. They don't have to be, you know, games that individual students play or teams of students play. But um, you could, you know, I know I've used these things for my direct teach part of my lessons. So you could use it that way instead of just having kids on a computer playing the games. Right. Somebody asked earlier, Colleen, if you were a graphic artist before you started <laughs> this adventure. Uh, no, I'm a pitiful artist. Um, that's, that's the one thing I can't do. And um, I, I really wish I had that ability because I think I could do so much more with, with some of the game ideas. But um, no, I, I would love to collaborate with a graphic artist. I think that would be wonderful. And if anybody knows anyone who might have an interest in something like that, uh, please have them get in touch with me. I, I think that would be great. Um, someone just asked what I use to design. I, I do all my work in, in Flash. Um, but my, okay. focus is, my focus is really on the programming. Um, and then I just do the best I can you know, with the images. But um, I think it could be a lot better. And um, somebody asked about suggestions for kids with um, developing English skills so that they don't freak out or fail on the word problem. Um, what exactly is the question? How to um, develop? I think ways that you can use these activities um, for students with kids that are just developing their English skills. Um, that's that's not something I have any experience with, but I'm certainly open to suggestions about how to make that happen. Yeah, I would be open to um, having it translated into other languages. Um, we just have to uh, have someone who would be willing to do that translation. Um, Tammy, um, yes, on the About page, if you go to the main navigation, there's an About section. Um, there's an email link for me. And I'm also on Twitter, so you can always contact me that way. I'll put my uh, Twitter name in here. Um, 
So that's another way to contact me. This is Tim uh, calling. I'm just curious, do you, do you, are you able to keep track of this? I should start. This is all just fabulous. And I've known of your work for years, but I, honestly, I didn't know the depth and breadth. And just curious if you keep track of usage um, in by people in other countries or somehow in other languages. Um, yes, um, by country, um, I think it's up to about 25% of site traffic is coming from other countries. Wow, that's great. Um, I don't I don't look too carefully at my um, my site analytics. I, I guess I should really do that. Um, I just kind of keep track of, of how many are coming and not so much um, who they are or where they're coming from. Sure, sure. <laughs> That's one way to look at it, Tammy. <laughs> so, Colleen, are you working on, currently working on a new project, or do you have a couple of ideas for projects, um, and you're not sure which one to start on next? Um, actually, you've caught me in between things. Um, I don't have a project that I'm currently working on. I think I think I want to head in the direction of of translating some of those games that we're doing at the center, those role playing type games, and trying to make interactive versions of, of those. So I'm I think I'm going to try to head in that direction, but I haven't actually begun anything. I'm I just ended a game project this week and um, you know haven't haven't really uh, decided which way to go. Um, I'm very interested in this app development, so I, I don't know if I should start looking at the language that I need to learn to develop apps, or I should just wait for Flash to come up. But that's something that's sort of preoccupying me, too. A lot of people have requested um, an app version of Thinking Blocks. So um, I'm, I'm kind of uh, giving some thought to how that might be done. And that might actually help pay some bills if you charge 99 cents or $1.99 because I just got an iPhone and I have kids and they're always right. borrowing my iPhone. I'd love to see them use it for your work. Yeah, I, I think I think that would be a way to go. Um, someone asked, um, oh, did you say you are creating iPhone apps? Sherry, I'm, I'm just in the contemplation stage. Um, I, I know that will happen eventually, but I... I guess I'm reluctant to learn a whole new language. Uh, the language that you use to create iPhone apps is completely different from the language I'm using to create um, Flash games. So rather than learn a whole new language, um, I'm hoping that I can create things in Flash and then um, have them produced in app form. Um, so that's kind of what I'm waiting to, to know more about. Oh, and hey, calling back to um, MathCast, your, your wonderful MathCast, and you know how partial I am to those. I was I was re realizing just how because I've been making all sorts of other kinds of videos and putting them up on YouTube and just seeing how much that drives traffic. And I was wondering if you um, had some volunteers um, create the scripts for your or at least for some of your math videos on your site, if you might consider having those go up on YouTube so that they could be you know, auto automatically translatable and you know how it does the marrying up of the script with the audio. And I'm finding actually a lot of schools um, do not have, they're smart enough not to have YouTube blocked, at least oh, for really? teachers. Yep, I'd say 90% of schools in Wisconsin, I'm really pleased, do not block YouTube for teachers. I mean, That's cause they're, amazing. Wow. Yeah. And then the other thing is, I'm sitting here with an actual uh, smart pen and a box here on my desk, and I've decided who to give it to, and it's my friend Colleen. And, and we've talked about this before, but one of the reasons is in about uh, 
at the end of March, April, there's going to be an iPhone app to play Pencast on iPhones or iTouches, I suppose. Uh -huh. So I'm just thinking, if you've made a few uh, uh, pen casts with a smart pen and put them up uh, for as a resource, that that could also help drive parents and other people to your site and to your other um, apps that are for the iPhone. And I would love to see that happen because you've worked so um, for so many years on all this work, it, and it needs to have. Um, you know, everyone using it and find a way for it to provide you with some compensation, even though that wasn't your primary goal. But I just think of if you could work, say, half time teaching and half time this and then another half time in the middle of the night or on weekends because you'd still do that. That would <laughs> <Right>. be cool. <laughs> um, actually, both of your ideas are great. I, I'm open to both. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Cool. This has been a fabulous session. I'm glad so many people are still on calling. It's a testimony to just how drawn we are to um, your work and the, the, the power of it. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for being here, everyone. I, I really appreciate the support. And, and I hope um, you find things you can use on Math Playground. Uh, if you do, and if you start using the site with your students, um, you know, don't hesitate to, to get in touch and, and let me know how it went. Thank you, Colleen, for a fabulous session. There is just so much wonderful content on your sites. And I know we're all going to be spending some more time this afternoon just exploring. Thank you all for coming and for adding your suggestions in the chat. And we'll be posting the recording and the chat and all of these great links um, on our site just as soon as they're available. So we'll all log out now so that we can start the recording. And um, be sure to complete the survey if you'd like to receive a certificate. So we can send that out to you. It'll probably go out on Monday when we get the survey results. So thank you all for coming. And have a great weekend.